Hey everyone, Cream Ray here, and today I have Oliver White on with us. Hey Oliver, how's it going? I'm doing well, man. How about yourself? I'm doing good, thanks. I mean, you know, I want to say thank you for joining us today, and I'm very excited to do this interview with you. Um, so before we get started, can you introduce yourself to the viewers? Absolutely. My name is Oliver White. I'm an ex-pro soccer player, retired in 2020. But before that, I spent around four years playing pro. Was My first two seasons was in Australia, playing in the MPL Victoria, the second division below the A-League. And I spent a year playing the USL in the U.S. Spent some time with Memphis 901 in the USL Championship, and then went on loan temporarily to Ford Madison in USL League One in Madison, Wisconsin. And then in my last year, I was signed for a team called Cavantilli FC in the first division in Ireland, which is right below the Premier League, and was there for a little bit through their preseason and start of season. And then COVID happened, and that was March 2020. And then from there in, until now, I've been staying active. I decided to start a foundation called the Oliver White Foundation after my retirement to spread the message of, first of all, just Black excellence, showing how many so amazing, cathartic things Black people can do when they work together, they help and support each other but also trying to bring in soccer and the communal aspect of being positive and helping generate positive change. One of the big pillars of my foundation is these jerseys that I sell, which are all in commemoration of someone who has unfortunately and unlawfully been killed at the hands of a police officer. And this, this jersey here commemorates Breonna Taylor. And every jersey that I sell commemorates someone who was murdered because they're unarmed. And that's something we can talk about later on. But the most important thing about the foundation is to amplify black excellence as an avenue to discuss some unfortunate happenings in the black community. And so that's why I love wearing the shirt, wearing the shirt as much as I can, send the shirts out to a bunch of people, hopefully to raise the message, spread awareness, things like that. Um, but, and then before my professional career, I played four years at Harvard, played division one, had over 60 appearances. And before that, I grew up and played club soccer in the greater Boston area and won a few state cups and was Gatorade Player of the Year for Massachusetts in 2012. This is massive, massive. Like, first of all, hashtag Black Excellence. I want to congratulate you on all your success. You know, being a part of the 1%, becoming a professional footballer. I've I seen the foundation and you mentioned the foundation. That's huge as well. It's not, it's not something simple to get involved in or, or start up. It takes time. And then, um, you know, what you're standing for is absolutely amazing. So congratulations to you. And where, where can the viewers find that jersey that you just spoke of? Absolutely. Uh, so you can find my personal Instagram, at OWhiteChucks, and then there's a link in my bio. But also, if you want to go to the foundation's dedicated Instagram, it's at OWhiteFoundation, and there's a link in that bio as well. If you want to go straight to the website, you can go to theoliverwhitefoundation.org slash jersey, J-E-R-S-E-Y. Guys, go check that out. Support it, man. Um, you know, and the third thing I do want to say is Harvard. Like, you know, when people hear Harvard, they think like this is like one of the top. It's one of it's actually one of the top schools. But, you know, I want to dive in, into that with you a bit. But um, let's let's just start with, you know, the beginning, right, where soccer all started for you. So can you just take us back in time, Oliver, and just share how you got involved into the beautiful game? Happily. Absolutely. It's like, I love how you said the beautiful game because it's the sport of the world. It's so beautiful. It's so fluid. There's so much rhythm. So many different cultures have an influence on it that it's, it's a constantly evolving melting pot that I think is amazing. And I still try and play as much as I can to this day. And the reason I do that is because I started playing at four years old. So that's almost 23 years ago now because I have three brothers, one younger and two older. And so, of course, me walking around a little three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old, I want to do everything my big brothers were doing. And so it was just an amazing way to spend time with them, get exercise, learn a new skill, and develop as a person. And so it's, it's all I wanted to do basically for my entire childhood. I know as I got a little older, I branched out, I played a bunch of different sports, but soccer has always been the biggest love for me. And it was amazing that it became a way that I really could connect with my brothers, even though, I mean, I would lose constantly. Play one-on-one, two-on-one, one-v-two, and get destroyed. I mean, they're each. First one is four years older, the one after that is about three years older than him. So there's no competition. But I would say from a very young age, like I just removed excuses from my mind in a sense. It's like, well, I'm playing against my brother Max. He's eight, I'm five. I don't care, I wanna win no matter what. And that actually transcended, I think, pretty seamlessly into playing at a higher level than playing professional. Because at the end of the day, when it comes to being a pro, it's about the paycheck, you know? I mean, it's a beautiful game, it's a game we all love, and I still love it to death. 
But like, if you're not delivering results, you're fired. If the coach isn't delivering results, fired. If the sports trainer isn't delivering results, fired. So like, it, it put a mindset in my head from like a young age before I was even a teenager that was like, you gotta drive, you gotta have drive, you gotta push, you gotta try and win no matter the circumstances. So from like I was four or five years old, I started playing playing with my older brothers. Yeah, that's huge. I mean, you know, playing that means I mean they're good, right? Being older than you, they had more experience per se. But that, that's amazing to have that mentality at that age of five. Um, so, were you the first in your family to go pro, or did any of your other family members, your, your other brothers, go pro? Great question. Uh, I was the first to play professional soccer. Yeah, at least at least that that I know of in terms of my immediate family. My immediate, my one older, my brother that's one older than me, he actually played Division One at Boston University. So that was always, he's always a big inspiration for me and motivation. I was trying to catch up to him and, and beat him and match him. So I try to play Division One just like him. But I was the first to play pro that I know of. Nice. So, you know, damn, there was something that you mentioned that I wanted to ask you here. Oh, I like the point that you said it was very cutthroat, right? The game's cutthroat. It's about a paycheck, which is true. But, you know, Canada and the U.S. is a pay-to-play system, not like Europe where the academies are free. Unless you're playing for an MLS team, um, academy person, and, you know, everything is taken care of. But, you know, in, in the U.S., let's specifically focus on that, that it's a pay-to-play system. So how'd you get in? How'd you transform into the mindset that, you know, you want to, you know, this is not a sport. This is a job, right? Because I find that there's a lot of athletes um, that are in the mindset of, well, it has to do with the whole system, but it's a paid to play. How did you go from paid to play or did you even start in paid to play? And then how did you, you know, get into the mindset of like, yo, this is a job. I need to make some, I, I need to get paid for my abilities, my services on the pitch. How was that transfer, um, that transition? Absolutely. So uh, I would say we have a great point that the U.S. Academy, it's, it's a little behind. It needs further development. And from that, it needs investment. And that's another strategy and another, another conversation for another day. Because even when you're talking about like, so the MLS Academies, at least when I was playing, it only picked up at 16. So like your true development is going to begin at maybe eight. And you're going to be forming into one of your better forms of yourself at 16. So that's eight years of development. That's not being watched over by elite minds with strategic strategies that are set from top to bottom. So I would love to see a lot of, progress made from that standpoint when it comes to actually my personal growth so I, I was fortunate in the way that growing up all the way through the end of college honestly I had a very strong competitive drive and I knew that I wanted to be the best division one player I possibly could be and so those two things gave me a really strong foundation and the reason for those goes even further back my family my brothers friends people I care about I'm so grateful for them but the, the, that two those two foundational steps of Having a drive, I want to be the best divisional player I could be, put me in the right mindset to be successful and to believe in myself. But I'll tell you that that jump to be able to take it fully serious as a professional did not occur until the January of my senior year in college. So that winter, we have so colleges, friend watching out there who goes high school, whatever, colleges have a longer winter break. They're usually off until maybe late January. So every year I knew I'd try to train, train in the U.S., but that final fourth year I had an opportunity to actually go train with a team called St. Patrick's Athletic in Dublin, Ireland. And I went there for about two and a half weeks. I knew I was going to come back, but it was like, let me kind of get my toe in the water, see what the program is like, can I hack it? And the thing that I got there and really just changed everything was that from the moment you walk in, the coach, A, demands a lot of you, and B, basically disregards your age. Like there were kids who were 16, 17, 18, playing with the first team because they could do it. And there were guys who were 28, 29, 30, 31, also playing with the first team because they can do it, right? And so I'm a senior, so I'm 21 at that point. And it's just like, wow. First of all, I thought I was good. These kids are nasty. These kids are nasty. They have less support when it comes to the nice facilities, nice equipment, things like that, but they have that drive. So right away, that flipped the switch. And then the disregarding of eight, I was like, okay, I'm 21. I feel like a young kid. I'm not that young. Coach, from the day one, you know, it's like, all right, you're producing results or you're not. There's plenty of other teams in Ireland that are amateur teams, semi-professional teams, and they'll kick you down the ladder to those, like, in a heartbeat because they don't have time. Similar to how it's such a beautiful game that's so widespread across the world, all the good that comes from that also means that there are millions of players that will jump in and take your spot for less money in half a second. 
So that was so that experience in the winter of I guess it would have been winter of 2016. It was like okay, this turned the switch for me. And one it was like, hey, I got to set up my seriousness. But B, it gave me confidence. I was like, okay, I can play with these guys, but I got to be a little bit better. I got to keep improving, but I know I can do it. Yeah, the great points. So can we um, share the blueprint? So, you know, did you start off in um, house league rep? Um, call, uh, you know, you finished high school, went to, um, was it college you went to? And then, and then Harvard? Can you like, can you just blaze the trail of like steps that you took that led you to pro? Absolutely. So starting off four years old, played just in town, whatever rec league is on the yellow team, playing the blue team, orange team, whatever. So that's four years old through maybe like eight, nine, ten. Ten years old, played travel league for a few years. I joined my first club team at in sixth grade. So I think that's 11. And so that is club, but it's not, a, it wasn't academy. Academy didn't exist at that point, but it was Maple. So Massachusetts area Premier League soccer, something like that. But you just played other club teams, and that was a pay-to-play system. And that was for a team called FC Bolts. And then played club through college. So through, excuse me, through the end of high school, leading into college. And also I played at, so I ended up going to a prep school that's known for athletics in a way. So I went to a prep school for athletics, for soccer, freshman year through senior year. So eight years of club, four years of club and high school at the same time. Then went to college. Every summer in college, I played on either a PDL team or a college league team for those summers. And then that took me to senior year of college. January of senior year, I went and went to St. Patrick's Athletic in Dublin, came back, trained with the Harvard team again through the spring as a senior. That summer, I actually went back to St. Patrick's Athletic. I performed well enough that past January to be invited over the summer for a trial. Played relatively well. And then, so that was from early June, I had about a one month trial to like early July and then ended up pulling my quad, unfortunately. From there, I had to take a step back. I stayed in Europe to see if I could like scrounge up any other opportunities, but it was a lot of rehab, a lot of fitness, a lot of getting back to where I thought it was. After about three weeks of injury, I got an opportunity to fly to a team in Finland. Played there about 35 minutes in, pulled the quad again. It was done. I thought my career was over, so I had to fly home and just reset. I kept training and going to combines, but like I actually got a, a full-time job working at that point. And it's not the thing that I want to emphasize that it's it's very easy to encounter setbacks on this on this journey if you want to become a professional player. So many people get pushed back. And it's not about accepting the setbacks as final. It's about working through the setbacks and finding a solution to help you get forward again. So I got a full-time job, but I mean, I didn't make excuses. I just trained in the morning for work. I trained after work. Okay. So that was the full fall of 2016. 2017, January, I got an opportunity to go to Australia. Went down there, scored 11 goals in my first season. And then from there, it took off a little bit. Yeah, I mean, and that takes discipline, focus. What does that come from for you? Does it come from your family? Was it just, you know, something that, you know, you developed by yourself? How did you come across these? How did you come across discipline and focus? Absolutely. I think... Family is a big part. Seeing the people in my family, I have a, a lot of great role models that have been set before me, and they're great because they found something that they're really good at, and they allow their passion to push them. Mm. And so that was me with soccer. I knew I loved it from the very beginning, and I allowed that passion to make me not care I was getting up at 6 in the morning to go work out, make me not care I was giving up Friday night parties to go work out, track practice, train, travel to a tournament, play a game, things like that. So that passion helps you keep the focus. But in terms of keeping the dedication going as well, that I think came from my competitive spirit. Just knowing that there's so much I wanted to achieve, whether it's an actual achievement like winning a game or to achieve like knowing I can step my game up, I can get my touch a little bit cleaner, I can shoot better with my left foot. And so that drive pushed me to keep get, becoming the better version of myself. So that coupled with the passion came together along with the great support system, thankfully, from my parents and my brother and someone who he doesn't even know how much he pushed me, but me pushing to try and be as good as my brother helped me so much as well. So it's all about making it all work within the system that's kind of set for you and understand, use your passion to push you, use your competitive edge to commit you. Yeah, shout out to the family. I th so I think this is pretty interesting. So you, you mentioned the prep school. Um, you know, I've never been personally to prep school. So at what age did you go into prep school? And w w what, you know, benefits come from going to a prep school and experiences you get um, that are unique 
or, um, you know, yeah, unique is the word I'm looking for that Absolutely. comes from going. Go Absolutely. Ahead. So this, the prep school I went to was pretty relatively known for recruiting athletes or having good athletics. So off the bat, that's probably the biggest benefit. Because when I was going through my recruiting process to go to college, they know that I'm coming from a school that athletically prepares you to play at the next level, but also educationally prepares you to balance academic and athletics, and also educationally prepares you because their goal is to send students to college in order to succeed. So it has somewhat of a collegiate mentality. It's a little bit different than, than other schools because they sometimes have AP courses, which are college equivalent courses. They have college prep people. They also have certain advisors that are used to speaking to athletes and helping them get to the next level. So that is one, well, those, that's a combination of very important things that I think the school does very well. In terms of the age, so that's freshman year through senior year of high school, four years. So you go, you graduate at 18, so you go at around 14, 15. So in terms of making that experience so unique and beneficial, it's first of all, knowing that the system there is in place to help you move along. And even though it's not perfect, every, every system has shortfalls, some people fall through the cracks, not every athlete comes in and makes it to the next level. But knowing that there's such like a high number of athletes that have come before you and have gone through, that encourages you. And then the second thing I, I would say is that because these schools are technically not supposed to recruit, but the name recruits themselves, the connections recruit, even though the coach isn't offering a scholarship for high school per se, the coach has coached many good players, so he knows the good players, he knows the friends of the good players, and his name moves in front of him, so that effectively recruits. And while they don't go out and offer scholarships, what it does is it attracts a really strong talent base. And then, as you can imagine, every single school in the league is doing that as well to a certain extent. So another layer of that is when people knew I was coming from the school, which is called Noble and Greeno, they knew I was getting prepared educationally, physically, athletically, but also playing competition from other schools at a very high level. That's solid. Wow, I really see the value in that. And did you know, like, when you're graduating, you're at 18, did you know that, you know, all right, I'm going to go to college and then Harvard? Was that in the blueprint? Was that in the plan? Or did those things just fall into place as soon as, you know, all right, you, you knew what your next step was? Was to, Wait, actually, first of all, did you know your next step was to go to college and then Harvard? Or how did that, like, all come together is basically the question. For sure. Um, so I was fortunate enough, a lot of people, so when it comes to Division One, you get recruited. So I went straight from high school to Harvard. Mm. Some people go stop in the way, go to JUCO, intermediary school, things like that. But I knew, so after my junior year of college, I committed to Harvard and I had my letter of intent. So I basically knew I was going to get in. Nothing is guaranteed, but what it means is the coach goes to admissions, says, I have seven players in my recruiting class. I want to get in. Let me present them to you first before you look at every other application. From the from the regular students so it's really fantastic and it's it's very exclusive but it's a result of you putting in years and years of hard work to be good enough to be recruited and to be valued and to be wanted as one of those top seven players so i knew from my junior year all the way through my entire senior year and then that summer going to the fall that i was going to harvard absolutely i mean that's a huge accomplishment so um I guess to go back a little bit more, was, was the plan always to go to Harvard? Was that always in the movement? Or did that just come after afterwards? After you? Was the goal to go pro after Harvard? Sorry. No, sorry. So was the plan always to go to Harvard? Was that always the intention from you and your family from, you know, from, the, you know, from going to prep? Was it, you know... Gotcha. Yeah, that, that's the question. Did you always know from prep, like, this is the goal that I want to go to college and then Harvard? Or how did it all come about? Is, you know, I'm trying to figure, I'm, right now, what I'm trying to share is, you know, was the intention always there or did it just come along the journey? Absolutely. Great question. Uh, the intention was always to go to prep school because I knew it would prepare me to go to college. And the goal was to go to a division one college because it has a competitive nature. It's like I want to achieve at the highest level possible. It wasn't entirely Harvard. I always knew, like, going, growing up in Boston, it's a great school. would love to go there. But BC is also a great school. really wanted to go there as, as well. So it was never, like, one school was the end-all, be-all. Okay. And that prep, like, exactly like I was saying, is I wanted to be prepared to play Division One, but also face the academic rigor that comes with being an athlete and a student at Division One school. So the prep was to prepare myself for all those things altogether. When it came to getting recruited, I actually didn't get a letter from Harvard till like, I think February 
of my junior year. And when I got it, I was like, okay, great. This is awesome. Probably not going to go there. Like my grades aren't good enough, this, that, whatever. And then, but I kept going on the recruiting process, kept entertaining it. The coach really liked me. And it turned out that I really fit his plans. He wanted a striker that could drop deep a little bit as well and link the play. And that's what ended up working out, which I'm so grateful for. And so I, I say all this to kind of give the advice that in hindsight, it's so easy to look back and say, okay, I should have planned to go to Harvard the whole time. But when you're in the process, you have no idea how it's going to happen. So you really need to have an open mind, respect all the possible opportunities, and, and have the optimism that maybe it could turn out better than you could ever imagine. And then three, just respect. Like every coach that emailed me, even if I was like, I definitely don't want to go to the school, I'm going to email them back, get information about the program, and know that like it's such an honor for coaches to have reached you search out your contact information, watch your video, and reach out directly like, hey, we really like you. And it's something that should never be taken for granted because you get past the game, people who don't quite make it, people who are 10, 20 years removed, it's very rare people are going to search you out. Like, hey, I really like your game. I really like how you presented in those meetings. I really like how you shook my hand at the door. Like, it, it doesn't, doesn't work like that. Sports are so different that you really should just appreciate every opportunity that comes your way and have the open mind to this to think that maybe it could work out. And by casting the wide net, being open to a lot of interactions that come to you, then you really will see the best of people. Because when you give them respect, the coach will give you respect back for the most part. And then you'll be able to pick, okay, now the respect is out of the way. Every coach that was not really that hot on me, I'm pushing it to the side because it wasn't worth respect. Mm -hmm. But now that the ones really like me, then I can take that off the list and move down to my next criteria of, did they play the right formation? Is, this, is it in the state that I want to go to school? Does it have a major I really like? Do I get along well with the coach? Do I get along well with the teammates? Things like that. Amazing. So what tips can you share with the viewers that, you know, don't know what their next steps are? If it's if they want to continue to pursue to try to go pro or if, um, you know, they want to go to college or university, you know, what tips can you share with them? Absolutely. It's very, there's no blanket answer, which is the first thing. There's so many different paths to take. And that's probably the first bit of advice I would give. So when I was when I went when I went into college, I was like, okay, I need to play as well as I can. Senior, get invited to the MLS draft. I'll get drafted, and I'll just play from that spring. And then there we go. And that just didn't happen. And so for a lot of my college career, I was a little discouraged. I was like, okay, I still want to be the best college player I can be, but I'm not getting the buzz from the MLS team, so I'm probably not going to go to the draft. And basically, that's where it was. Even when I finished my senior season, I was like, wow, my, my pro dream is over. And for, I very fortunately came across the opportunity, thanks to a family friend of mine, to go play or try out for the team in Ireland. And then that's when I realized there's so many different ways to get to pro than to just go through the MLS draft. Like if someone only wants to be a pro to be in the MLS, they're probably not doing it for the right reasons. They kind of just want to be famous. They want to go viral on Instagram. The reason I wanted to go pro is because soccer meant so much to me that I wanted to be in a position where I could make soccer my main focus. I could make that my main paycheck. And even though I didn't make that much money, I knew as long as I was doing, I was taking care of what I had to on the soccer field, then I was going to be happy because that was my life, that was my job, and that was my paycheck, which was fantastic. So the, the first piece of advice I'll give is that there's so many different ways to go pro, but also you have to know you want to go pro for the right reasons. So that's, that's the highest level. If you have the commitment, you can do it for sure. But you got to be able to accept the setbacks, adjust your life. I mean, I might have to work a full-time job while training. I used to drive down to Connecticut to go to combines in October, November, play in a bubble, but still be freezing. And I was like, I don't care. I gave up my entire weekend to do this, and I would do it again. So yeah. that's going to grow. In terms of going to college, have, a, have conversations with people who you know are, are wise. They don't have to be specifically college athletes or college advisors, but talk about what's important to you. See what schools fit that profile, whether it's location, whether it's type of school, whether it's Division One, whether it's Division Three, things like that. See what fits that profile and then cast a wide net because you're only going to go through a process like that once in your life, maybe twice if you go to graduate school. And you're going to feel kind of bad if you look back and like, all right, I only had two schools on my list. I only got into one and I went to that one school. It's like, well, there are over 210 Division I college programs, probably at least 200 Division three college programs. That's only in the U.S. There are college programs in Canada and a bunch of other countries. So, like, I think it's, it's easier for me to have done in the moment and to look back on it because I love soccer so much that I was like, I'll go anyway. It'll take me to play. And I know for some people, they love soccer just as much as I do, but maybe success has come easier to them their whole life. So they're used to going straight into the first team. They're used to going straight to the MLS draft, things like that. And that's amazing. I take nothing away from it, 
but that is not the norm. That, that as you get higher and higher, there's more people wanting to get in and there's less people that actually get in. So I would say be open-minded, cast your wide net, treat people with respect, because you're seeing right away who treats you with respect back. Right. Um, and then taking it even one step further or back before that, when it comes to high school, recruiting is so different now, but I hate to say it, it's a lot about buzz. You gotta be good. You gotta score your goals, clear your headers, clean sheets, things like that. That's step number one. But step number two, the name of the game is to have that buzz and have that recognition. Now, you don't need to sell out and do 6,000 stepovers and barely score the goal on the field. Like, let's, let's be pragmatic. But still, it is about a little bit of buzz. And you'll find the more people that are aware of your one recruiting jersey, recruiting journey, excuse me, then it can create interest and attention from other possible schools, possible coaches. And then, again, you're still treating everyone with respect, but you build the most buzz. And then you can see what really is there for you. What is an actual opportunity? I would love to give more specific advice to if people want to talk to me or DM me on Instagram, I'm happy to. But in terms of just broad stuff, that's what I would say because everyone's path is going to be a little bit different. Yeah, I mean, can you just um, tell, tell the viewers again your, um, your Instagram so they know where to reach you? Absolutely. So it's at O White Chucks, letter O, W-H-I-T-E, Chucks. My, my name is Oliver White. It is kind of an odd Instagram handle, but I've just had it since high school and with someone in high school, I used to wear just white chucks all the time. So like, oh, white chucks is kind of a play on all white chucks. Yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's been so long, I just can't change it at this point. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I mean, again, great tips. I love the amount of detail that you're giving and the way you articulate yourself is, is, um, is great. I was going to ask you, where does, that, where does that come from? But that's off topic. Um, <laughs> So let's let's dive in a little bit into into um, into Harvard. I don't want to get too deep into it, you know. Just you know, what's the Harvard experience like, right? Because when I hear Harvard and I think about it, it's just like this massive thing, right? Like even after this interview, I want to go look at the website, see the facilities, just check it out, you know. Because in my mind, how it's been marketed and and from everything that you hear, it's obviously an, an amazing school. You've been there yourself. You have played for the, the their team, you know. Let's hear it from you. The man himself, Oliver White. Let's let's hear about it. Let's hear about it, man. I'm excited to hear about this. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> Harvard is, is intense. Uh, I will not lie to you about that. They they expect a lot of you in the classroom. That's before you even get on the field, right? And of course, it, it teaches you a lot of how to understand yourself, manage your time, and pick out your goals early. Because if you go in the first year like, oh, I'll do this, I'll do that, whatever, like people might do at other colleges, you're just gonna be blown away it's like wow if i don't even like the subject material i'm not gonna try hard in class and so from from day one it's like you're thrown in the deep end which is part of the reason why the admissions process is so rigorous they want to get candidates and students who will succeed but from day one educationally they're throwing in the deep end you've got to reach out for tutors on your own if you need them you got to see the professor on your own after class people aren't really chasing you down to help you out you got to create your own study groups and but from that you take that and it makes you so self-sufficient like you're just not even rattled by people expecting a lot of you when it comes to work. You're not rattled by having to face up or call a coach and ask for a tryout as a pro just because I've talked to so many professors who have written books, who publish around the world, who do speaking to and things like that, because that's what Harvard brings together. They bring together the best minds, and as a result, they expect most of you. So it's like, it's, it's a wild atmosphere. Everyone is very competitive, but also incredibly intelligent. And then you add on top of it, the four hours a day, more or less, you commit to playing soccer, including training, including post-game, and including rehab and eating. That's a massive chunk of your day right there that is not spent on school, that everyone else in the student body can spend on school, or social life, or catching up on sleep. So then, from there, like, halfway through my freshman season, so like a month or two, a year, a month or two into the first semester, like, your time management skills are unlocked. Because it's just, it's like, it's so necessary. That you're like, all right, I got to do this. I got to plan this out and move like that. So, like, it's a pressure cooker, but you come out of it so strong and prepared that it, it, it's all worth it. And there are plenty of people who go in and actually they want to do it in five years. They want to take a year off. They want to take two years off. And I actually would completely encourage that. Because what it does is it teaches you not only to be able to take a break, take a breath, and reflect and that, like, okay, I got into Harvard. I'm still meaning to be here. But at this point in my life, I want to take a second step back so I can come back even stronger. And that's something I think will apply to so many other things than just school. I mean, soccer, more than anything, if you're going on a losing streak, you got to change it up. 
you gotta take a break, maybe take a day off, do something different. And then when you come back, your head is a little fresher, a little more clear, and you can really attack it with the conviction that you know you should. So it, it, it's, it's an intense experience, man, but it was, it was very rewarding. Got it. So um, what'd you major in? I majored in sociology, and then I got a secondary in African-American history. Nice. And, you know, how is, like, the campus? Did you live on campus? I did, yeah. How, how is, like, the architect, the facilities, the, the change rooms, the fields? How is all that, you know? Absolutely. It's very cool. So it's, it's a city campus. It's in the city of Cambridge, which is just right next to Boston. And it, it's so awesome that there are certain parts of the campus that are fenced in and certain parts of the campus that are on their own. And the way that it makes it seem, I don't know if this is for sure, but it's like school was there before a lot of the city was there. So they built some of the roads and some of the office buildings kind of around it. That's why some parts feel really close together and some are kind of spread out. But it's fantastic because it helps you explore and learn about Cambridge through the campus and also through the city at the same time. One thing that was really cool is so there's the Charles River goes through the campus and the north side of the Charles River has all like the education stuff in the buildings. The south side has all the athletics. So when you cross the river, it's like a mental switch. Sorry, there's a siren in the background. But it's like a mental switch. It's like, right, I'm going over the bridge, I'm biking, walking, whatever. Now it's time to really get to work. Now it's time to play soccer and be the best I can be. I love the facilities. We had a grass field and a turf field, indoor workouts, and a tennis building workout that was a little more plyo and body weight. And then we had a really nice locker room, all wood lockers, boot room, TV, couches, showers, all that stuff. They do a really good job of keeping that up, keeping that up to date and state of the art. And I was really appreciative for that. Appreciative for that. Nice. Um, so let's, let's dive into you. Um, where do you originate from and what passport do you hold? And if you have multiple passports, yeah. Absolutely. So my family, uh, my dad's side is from the West Indies, from Jamaica. My mom's side is African-American or black. Uh, I was born in Boston. I've been there for basically my entire life and I hold US and Jamaican passports. Nice, nice, nice. So, okay, the reason why I'm asking is because, you know, you've played in Australia, you've played in Ireland, these are your, you know, this is outside of the Ameri America. So, I mean, this is a little bit further into the conversation, but I mean, let's, I mean, it's connected. So I want to ask, you know, obviously before you went to those two countries, sorry, I'm assuming here, but let me ask, did you, you went pro before you went to these two countries, right? So I technically was pro when I went to Australia. So my first pro contract was playing in Australia. Okay, got it. So, okay, so you didn't start off in the USL. You went straight to, sorry, you said Australia. Yep. Okay, so how did that all happen, right? Because you hold an American passport. I mean, I'm not too sure of the, the rules over there if you have to have a European passport. But yeah, please explain, you know, that, that, Absolutely. that process. Absolutely. So every country is different. I can only speak for, I only speak for Australia at this point. So they have what they call a point system. Every player costs 10 points. Mm. And then you're going to have a max of 200 points on your roster. But to be an international player, that takes you to 20 points. But the opposite side is if you're a homegrown player or a developed player through the academy, it's five points or three points. So every team can only get up to 200 points. So for me to go to Australia, they were happy to get me a visa as long as I was performing. So my, but the two years I was there, I was a 20-point player on both teams. And that ratchets up the expectations and it makes them error for mistakes very small so even in my first year they almost cut me because there's another international player they wanted to bring in eventually i could turn my form around and it was okay but i mean that's what it is the reason i decided to go to australia actually just when i was trying to go pro do my combines in that fall when i was coming back from injury i basically reached out to every single contact i had in the soccer world one of them had moved down to australia and was kind of a scout for this pro team that i ended up signing for fc Belize. So he put me in contact with them. They needed a striker. They saw my video. They liked me, and they signed me right away. And I think it's a perfect example of if I knew I wanted to go pro to, yes, get paid, but I wanted it to be my life. I wanted to be have soccer as a profession. And the only place in the world, literally in the world, because I tried to get use our contracts as well, and they were not offering them to me. The only place in the world they gave me a contract was Melbourne, Australia, which was 14 hours ahead and 22 hours away on a plane. And I said, yeah, I'm willing to do that because I had my motivation set. I knew what I wanted to be. So, like, if you have an open mind and clear goals, it's out there. But that's, it's going to come from an unpredictable path. I never thought the person who got me the opportunity who was one of my former coaches. I never thought something that promising would come from knowing him. But that's another reason why you treat everyone with respect. You make sure you shake their hand, you look them in the eye, and then you talk to as many people as you can. So that's how that opportunity came about. 
Um, in terms of having like multiple passports, so my dad is Jamaican, it's something that I identify with. I was born and raised in America though, so I'm more American than Jamaican, as you can also hear from my voice. But I know the reason I had the passport, thing like that, is so I can set clear goals in my mind. So this will sound maybe a little bit funny, but the two goals I had was one, I want to play for the Jamaican national team. Unfortunately, it never happened. And two, I wanted to be a player in FIFA. So I wanted to be on a team that was high enough that was in the video game, they would come through it and take my snacks and stuff like that. Yeah. And like, although I didn't complete either of the goals, that's okay because to me, it was all about setting something that's very clear. And every day I wake up in the morning, it's like, all right, I see those two goals. What am I doing to get closer to them? And that's all you can do, you know? Right. So, I mean, I know about the visa process. That's a little complicated and it, it takes time. But how was that for you? Was it something that the team took care of and they're like, yeah, we want you, we're going to do the visa for you? Or did you have to go um, on your own and do that whole visa process? Great question. So what I would recommend for people is that whenever you have a country that you possibly can go to, you might have a lead with a coach, do all the research you possibly can on visas. Know the options, know which one you probably would get, stuff like that, but then don't do it yourself. Because I would say a lot of places you can go to, you can just go on a vacation visa if you're not getting paid. So that'll give you 30 days or 90 days to go there and do your trial. Once you sign, if you sign a full professional, then likely you have to get a visa to, in order to make money and maybe pay taxes in that country. But the reason I recommend do all your visa research and don't apply to any, because for a lot of teams, they will apply for you. And that also is a sign of them respecting you, want to make sure things are seamless and they get you into the team. But the reason you want to know about your, about your visa stuff is because the team, they can have one admin person who does all the admin for the entire team. That person's a little bit swamped. So what you'll do is you'll just keep asking them, hey, is my visa through? Is my visa through? And then if it, comes, it becomes appropriate, then you can offer up some of your information and say, well, actually, I know there's this one visa, the CX7Y, which is different than the CX7Z, that actually you can apply to, things like that. And it shows you're invested in the process. But the reason I say you don't necessarily want to apply for the visa yourself at the beginning is because if you show up, it's like, hey, I have a visa, I have this, I have that. The team may use it like, okay, cool, this person is smart, this person has money, we're going to pay them less than you would have. We're going to value them a little bit less. Whereas like, when you let them do the visa process, they're like, okay, we really like this kid. We want to prove it by getting his visa done, doing the research, making it all seamless for him so he's happy with the way the club is treating him. So I was fortunate enough, so my first year, they did the visa for me. My second year, I like basically, because I knew about the visa stuff in the first year, I was like, oh yeah, I kind of understand it. And then they're like, oh, you understand it? You got it. You just do it and we'll give you the money, which worked out, but like I would have much rather them to just do it and then I wouldn't have had to deal with the money at all. You know what I'm saying? So that's why it's valuable to know the process, but you have to be a little bit, a little bit cautious. Like, well, let me, hopefully they can do it for me and I'm willing to give any advice I have. Yeah, I mean, I know about the visa process myself. I love um, the point that you shared about, you know, that respect, right? That, you know, because I've had the disrespect. <laughs> so I know what that side is. I never got the respect side yet. <laughs> um, but saying that, that is huge. I like how you said respect, right? You know, actually, first of all, under, understanding, doing your own research about the visas and what visas, so you know, you have that, um, that information and understanding, and then having that respect again from the team, if they really want you as they did, they really wanted you and them willing to invest in you and take care of that part of the side of visa and getting that for you. So then you can come over and make sure things are set up properly. Very, very great points. Again, man, this is a great interview. So okay. So, you know, you went, you went from Australia and then what were the next, so you played on four professional teams. Yep. So you I was went, Australia for the two seasons and Australia. then I was in the U.S. after that, in the USL. You were in the USL and then after the USL, you played in the USL championship, USL one. And then after that, you uh, went to Ireland. That was the last, sure. that's yep. the last place you played. And then, you know, um, so yeah, that, that'd be interesting to, to share as well. I mean, I, I don't want to. Let's try to go through those ones quickly. Um, so, you know, you, you had your two seasons in Australia and then in the, how'd you come back to the States? How'd that all come about? Absolutely. So after my first year in Australia, I actually wanted to play in the U.S. and went to a bunch of tryouts 
it didn't quite work out, but I knew I had made good inroads in Australia, so I signed for a different team, same league, same location. So I went back there for another year. But so every off season I'd been to go, I'd been going to these open tryouts for the USL and the USL League One, or I guess it wasn't League One at that point, but there were a couple of other leagues that were in existence, and I'd go to all these open tryouts. I don't know if they're a great use of time because there's so many kids there that just can't play because it's open. Anyone can show up. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, because the U.S. system is lacking so much infrastructure, that's one of the few ways to get in the door. So what I would recommend for people is that do your research, try and see if you have any like tangible fourth degree connection with any coach that won these tryouts. Because if you can just get your name on their radar, then you can then go and play for sure. Because like there are 500 kids there the coaches will know about 80 and they'll like about 15. But if you're one of those 80 who they at least know the name, they've had one instruction to before, then you're already ahead of like 400 kids. It sucks though, it costs like 250, 350 a trial, that's not including flights, hotel, rent a car, et cetera. So you have to be sparse with the way you dish out your time. But I would, I would recommend going to them ultimately. And that's what I did throughout the whole winter after my first year and my second year. And my second year, I was fortunate enough that going on that circuit led to me signing for Memphis 901. Nice. What changed when you signed, you know, your first contract in Australia, you know, in your life? How did, you know, how did everything change for you? That's a great question. Cause like, so the day I signed my contract, it just felt amazing. Like food tastes better. Music sounded brighter. Sun was <laughs> a little higher, things like that. Right? Yeah. Like, then you notice, well, in reality, you're not making that much money. So you're like, all right, things are great. But it's like, you feel like, at least me personally, I was like, all right, but I still have so much more to prove. It was almost like, great, my foot's in the door, but I have so much higher expectations. I think I can be better than this level. And so like, it gives you a little more push. But I think like the main thing is it gives you like so much validation. After 20 years of busting my hump, like every day, basically missing so many weekends and parties and things like that. It's like, okay, you did this. So this team for at least one season recognizes that you put the work in so that is the first thing that changes it it was, it was awesome and just like to be able to look back on my life and be like for the rest of the, my of my days i played pro it was a few years maybe i wish it could have been a few more years but i did that and no one else did besides me like well other people have, other people have done it but like no one got me to that, that point besides myself is what i'm trying to say yeah massive and did you did you have any agent or you know uh sports lawyer to look at the contract how'd you go about that that is something that I learned a little bit too late. So like some of my earlier contracts, I almost signed another one as well that was like, just like, not, not ideal. It, it worked out because other, other things came to light. I was like, okay, I don't want to sign this contract, but that is very important. The tough part is not every agent wants to work with a player who they don't know. So it's not easy to have an agent. But I would say if you can't have people, especially when you're going overseas, it's, it's great if you can. I know money is a very real resource and it doesn't grow on trees, but it's great if you can have someone with a legal background look over the contract. Because there's certain words that just have certain meaning or different meanings in the legal sense versus the real world sense. You know what I'm saying? So there's, I almost signed a contract to go play in Lithuania that would give the agent power of attorney over me. And me reading that as a person, I was like, yeah, that makes sense. He's going to be my agent. It's going to be my, my legal representation. Power of attorney, good. But in the legal world, that means they can sign for you. Like they can, they have complete signing power, is power of attorney. And I didn't know that until I showed a friend of my dad's who is a lawyer. And he was like, no matter what you do, don't sign it. I'm sorry. I know you really want this, but don't sign it. And thankfully I did. And I told the person about it. And then we kind of kept working it out. And then I got another opportunity to go somewhere else. So it didn't really matter. But yes, I would say if you can get a little bit of legal representation, especially going overseas, try to. In the U.S., it's not as important because a lot of like collective bargaining agreements in the leagues, and now there's a new CBA for the USL, which is really cool. But definitely, if you can get a legal legal help, just look at it even once. Um, I actually did have an agent. I didn't really sign for him per se, but the way the USL kind of works is that a lot of agents will have maybe half the roster is like fully signed to them, and half the roster is just like their network of players who they know and they like and they respect. So if they get a call from a coach that says, hey, I want a kid to play center mid, and then the agent goes, oh, I know a kid named Damani who's not officially signed to him or whatever, but it's like, yeah, he's a good player, then I'll put him in touch with him, put him in contact with the coach, and then that player would sign for them. So when I signed for Memphis, 
the, the agent I was working with had good contacts with the team, and then I signed for him after I signed for the team. When people always think, oh, yeah, you have a super agent like Scott Boris or Mina Raiola, those guys, they signed with the agent before they signed with the team, but it doesn't quite work that way. Got it. So um, you mentioned your dad's friend was a lawyer and he looked over at the contract and told you not to sign it. What kind of lawyer is he? Is he a contract lawyer, immigration lawyer? He actually is just a, a, a contract lawyer, but he has a lot of background in soccer because he, he used to play major indoor soccer league back in the day. Shout out to Steve Gaines. He's a really, really good friend now. I'm really happy they helped me through that situation. And so he has soccer expertise, but he, he's not an agent. You know what I'm saying? Okay, got it. Yeah, that's awesome. Shout out to him. Um, and then, I mean, you know, to, to close out, I guess, towards the, well, not close out, but towards the end, um, you know, where has soccer led you now? Because, you know, talk about the nonprofit foundation, you know, really? I, I mean, I mean, before that, I guess, sorry, not to say I guess, but before that, where has soccer led you now? Absolutely. Well, soccer definitely led me to the nonprofit foundation. I mean, everything I try to do, I try to make it a true expression of myself, which is why the jersey tries to look like a soccer jersey, you know what I'm saying? But also, it brings in the representation, brings in commemoration of Black lives that were lost too soon. So, like, even the courage to have to blend all that together it comes from soccer. It comes from being on the field and trying new tricks, trying to slide a pass into someone where maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. That, that boldness, that creativity, that audacity, comes from soccer. That's affected so many parts of my life. Another part of it is that I feel like such a more complete person from having traveled the world. And I only would have had the opportunity playing soccer and being willing to take that risk. And to be completely honest, I don't think I would have moved to Australia just to move there. Like I, I, I loved it, but like it's hard to go there to make friends, things like that. Through soccer, it's helped so much. Now I've recently moved to New York and I play soccer as much as I can. It's helped me make friends on the team, be introduced to cool people, working cool jobs, cool apps, gives me a reason to get out and exercise, and motivate, especially during COVID when it's really hard to go out and just not feel like you need to be wearing a mask. But then if you're playing soccer, you're like, oh, well, we're moving around. It's great exercise. You feel a little bit more safe, even if it might not be completely safe. But that's just, that's just one example of how it can touch so many parts of your life. And it feels, I feel, I'm so fortunate to be able to possess that drive and understanding of a game like that. So that's where I am now. Yeah, sorry, I wanted to ask you a last question about Australia. Let's touch on the ugly side of things, right? You're, you're an outsider. Um, you know, these players are from that country, most of them, I'd, I'd, I'd guess. Um, how'd you break in, right? You know, how, how did they treat you? Did you guys speak the same language? Um, I just want to add that in there, sorry. I just thought about that real quick. For sure. Happy, happy to discuss it. And I, I had somewhat of a positive experience. So it, I'm very fortunate to have come in. When I came in, they knew this kid, he's American. He's a striker. He should be good in the air. Like, they'd see my videos. And because of that, it was like, okay, this guy is great. Make sure he feels welcome. And I'm so appreciative for the whole club, the family that owned the club, the fellow teammates, they brought me in. But at the same time, you're right. There is an ugly side of Australia. And there are a lot of instances where I did see people treating people with dark skin not that well. Mm. And it almost, it makes you even more aware of it because it's like, well, that person was actually nice to me when I showed up because of soccer, because they know I'm a high profile player and whatnot. But it, in like everyday life for someone who's not contributing to the team, they're gonna say that about them. And so there's an ugly side to Australia and a lot, of, a lot of countries. And it's things like that that actually made me even more aware of what can be done and how much, how beneficial this is to use your platform. My platform is not very large, but I know I want to create these shirts. I want to perpetuate my foundation so people know I'm always trying to put out positivity and help use my platform to push the message forward. And so breaking in, I'm very lucky, but it was not very difficult because like, all right, this is a high profile. I mean, striker, as you know, is Hollywood player, whatever, big deal, scores the goals, get the headlines. So they were like, come on in. We welcome you. Went out to dinner the first night, things like that. But, but at the same time, it made me even more aware that it was like, People were treating me like this because of soccer, not because mm. who I was, you know. Got it. Okay. Yeah, because, sorry, I, you know, it came to my mind. I'm just like, you know, I, I had that experience in, in Florida, Naples, uh, not similar to yours, but, you know, 
being from coming from Canada to the U.S. is kind of like taking someone's position, so on and so forth. So that's where I came up with that question, and it just popped up, and I wanted to ask. But um, before we dive into the fun questions, what are three tips you can share with the viewers that want to go pro? Three tips. Okay. Um, okay. One most important is that it's not only one way. It's like you don't have to go the MLS draft. There's a bunch of different ways to go pro, but you have to have is the willingness and the boldness to go out there. Um, I'm going to make the next two like a little more soccer specific because I feel like I haven't talked about it that much, right? So when you get to the next level, the first thing that changes is the speed of play. People close you down faster. People expect you to play faster. You got to communicate faster. And so the best thing you do, get your neck so strong and your periphs good that all the information you take in is literally every piece of information you can take in. So like you're scanning constantly, you're giving directions, you're put looking around, you know where you want to go before you get that. Because when you get to the next level, that's what everyone else is doing. And if, so if you're just getting used to it when you get to the pro level, you're behind. So you got to get used to it when, you, when you're building up to that point. Scanning, information, quick decisions. When you get the ball, you should know, I want to play there. If that breaks down, I want to play there. And if that breaks down, I have my safety pass, which is going backwards, even if it means the goalkeeper. And then the, the third tip, when you get to the pro level, if you go to any pro game, like I'm sure you have, it's just constant talk. It's just this, that, whatever, so much communication pointing direction. And it's great because it helps people, it helps you tell people where to go. They tell you where to go, but also it keeps you so engaged in the game. So like I would finish games, my throat is hoarse, like I have a headache, I'm talking so much, like I'm coughing in a way because it's just like, there's so much that just talking that comes out of your throat. And then the game ends and it just like goes off a cliff. So you're like, oh my God, why did I do that? When you look at the game and you look at what's going on, like, all right, well, that's exactly what I was talking constantly. It keeps you so engaged. It keeps everyone else engaged. So three tips of going pro. One, there's more than one way to go. There's a million different paths. You got to reach out to as many people in your network that you can. Two, when you get to the next level, you got to scan, take information, and make decisions quickly. But you have to decide. You have to prep that skill before you even get there, right? And three, the communication on the field is so imperative because it keeps your players focused and it keeps you focused. Nice. So this sparked up a question I, I, I just came up with too right now. You know, what do you think differentiated you from other players on the field that, you know, gave you that ability to go overseas to Australia and sign pro over there and be able to compete and uh, succeed? You said you scored 13, 12, 13 goals over there. Yeah, it's that is a tough one because that's going to be different with so many other people. I mean, the short answer is I knew. So since going to college, I was like, okay, I feel like I'm a big, excuse me, I feel like a big player. I wanted the MLS draft invite. I wanted to be one of the well-known faces in college soccer. And I felt like I almost underachieved and I had so much left in the tank. It's like, all right, I'm dying to prove myself. I want to keep going. Part of the reason why I was great, okay, going to Australia. Part of the reason why I was so clear of me, I wanted to play pro for certain reasons. But it's going to be different for everyone, to be completely honest. Yeah. Okay, for sure. And Last question before we go on to the um, 13 fun questions. You know, you talk about working really, really hard, right? You know, as athletes, we got to work extremely hard. Some work harder than others. For you, what did you do to recover? Like, you know, did you have a good system set up in place? Did you have a good habit flow of, you know, after training, you're Absolutely. taking care of yourself, food-wise, mental health, just, you know, your whole health? Absolutely. That's so important. When you get to... The next level, like everyone is so fast, so athletic. So like you need to bring your absolute best physical self every single day, which also couples with having your best mental health, but I'll talk about that second. So the first thing is you gotta get there early, you gotta stay late. Especially when you're someone like me just trying to break in without the hype, without the pedigree per se, that like the draft picks would have coming in right away. So yes, I mean it was so important to me that I would either hot tub, stretch, or hot shower before I played. Had to. And or foam roll. Using, using yoga balls, things like that, activate the muscles with the bands, okay? Afterwards, I ice bath every single day. The study for the ice baths have kind of been disputed, the changing, things like that, but I do things that make me feel good. So just, first of all, the numbness in the legs, second, constricting the blood vessels so the lactic acid gets pushed out was very valuable to me. So like recovery is massive. So that was always a big part of me. And I knew like, it wasn't just about ticking a box. It's like, you finish playing, you do what makes your body feel good. Sometimes you're rolling for an hour after you train and then you're rolling again after dinner. 
Sometimes you're giving up certain meals so you can eat just gross, plain, dry grilled chicken, but you know it's going to make your body feel better the next day. And when it comes to mental health, I think the best thing you can do is actually have people who you can confide in, people you can be open with and be trusting with and be like, I played terrible today. I just want to talk about it a little bit because like not bottling up allows you like the freedom and the liberty to share it, talk about it, and then you can hear things that you don't hear with it's just in your head. You can make the changes and make the conscious decisions that you're not going to make if things are just in your head. So mental health is actually arguably the most important thing because if you don't have the will, if I don't have the will to prepare to be my best at training every single day, then I'm not going to be my best physically. And that will to prepare only comes from the mental health being right. I'm steady. I'm positive. I know what my goals are. I know where I want to go. I know what I want to achieve. Mm -hmm. Got it. This, you know, master the basics. Master the basics. Absolutely. All right, let's <laughs> all over, let's dive into the fun questions. Nice. Um, just 13. Who's your favorite team? Arsenal. Arsenal, favorite player? Thierry Henry, bang. Henry, okay. Favorite without a doubt. What about your favorite pair of cleats? Ma Mercurial Vapors, without a doubt. Only ones I've ever worn. What's your most memorable soccer moment? Oh, great question. Um, I mean, a lot, a lot of them, honestly. My first goal in Australia was one of the most amazing experiences of my life, so I would say that. Nice. What, what was it, you know, that, you know, when you're thinking about it right now, that was like, yo, it was the most memorable moment of my, my life. For sure. For sure. So the team I played for was a team called FC Belize, who they have a bunch of rivals. One of their main rivals is a team called South Melbourne FC. So the year before I got there, Belize got promoted from the second division to the first division. And the first division where South had been in for like 20 years, had never been relegated, something like that. Mm -hmm. So there's a rivalry, opening game of the season. South scores early on in the first half, they're up one nothing. And maybe like the 70th minute, there's a, there's a cross from a dead ball to the back post. I jump up over one of their better defenders and score the header and equalize. And it just, the place went crazy. It was awesome. Wow. Just the atmosphere, right? Exactly. The atmosphere and also the moment and knowing like I was a new kid, but this rivalry had lasted longer than I've been alive. That, that right there certified you. They're like, yo, this guy's the truth. Right? <laughs> right? Right. Game one, I was like, that, that's an amazing feeling. And it was a header, too, of all things. It was like, let me get up and just like that. It was great. <laughs> Mom and Matt. Yes, sir. Um, did you ever play soccer in the house when you were a kid? Absolutely, all the time. Did you ever, like, break anything? or? Yeah, I've broken about, like, nine windows <laughs> in, my, in my family's home. <laughs> oh, my God. Not all with soccer balls, but probably, like, three with soccer balls, two baseballs, two lacrosse ball, one hockey puck, one golf ball, things like that. If it, if it wasn't soccer, what other sport would you uh, play? Um, I, love, I love sports, man. Bunch of sports. I guess I would say basketball. Like, if I could just pick one, basketball. Who, who's your team? Uh, the Celtics, Boston Celtics. Okay, Celtics. Yeah. Um, who's better, Messi or Ronaldo? Ooh, great question. And I'm going to not answer it, but I'm going to answer it. So Ronaldo is the best player on the planet, right? Messi is not from this planet. Got it. Okay. Okay. Adidas or Nike? Nike. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. Let's just say, you know, me and you, wait, do you, do you still play FIFA? Uh, no, actually I don't, which is so, it's just like not usual for a lot of people. Like we play pro and play at high level, but I don't really play FIFA. Got it. That's cool. Yeah, that's fine. I got it. So, I mean, let's just say back in time, all right, if me and you, or no, in the future, let's just say, you know, we're multiple <laughs> FIFA, you know, <laughs> Who's, who, who's your team you're choosing? If I'm playing FIFA? Yeah, you're about to play a FIFA game. There's $1,000 on the line. Let's just say you could win. Or $10,000. Who, who are you choosing to play against me? <laughs> wow. Um, I'm probably picking PSG. If, like, if money's on the line, but I know some people don't do five, so then I pick Arsenal. Okay, got it. Yeah. Um, who are you picking? Pardon? Who are you picking? Me? Right now, Liverpool. I'll go with Liverpool. They're nice. They're nice. Solid team. Um, favorite fast food place you go to? I don't really eat fast food, my guy. Nice. Uh, I would say one thing I love, I actually love donuts. So, like, I, my favorite fast food is donuts. I'll put it like that. Got it. What are, like, food-wise? What's your favorite food? You know, Italian. Food? Italian, for sure. Italian. I love pasta. I love pizza. Jeez. Okay. 
Um, who's your favorite artist and like what's your favorite artist? Who's your favorite artist and what's your favorite song? Great question. Um, my favorite album right now is The House Is Burning by Isaiah Rashad. I've been spinning that like crazy. My favorite song right now, I'm I'm not really sure, but Isaiah Rashad at the moment. You said the house what was that called? The house is spinning? What? The house is burning. It just came out this past summer. I've been spinning it constantly, man. It's sick. I'll check it out. Um two goals in a game or one goal and one assist? Oh, uh, one goal and one assist. Nice. Um, would you rather score a free kick or a PK? It's the last 90 minute. You guys are tied 1-1. One, one. Are you scoring, you know, do you want to score a free kick to win 2-1 or a PK? Free kick, without a doubt. Okay, a banger. Yeah, um, exactly. And like it, you're, expect, you're expected to score a PK, I'm not going to lie. You know, you score a free kick, crowd goes wild. No one expects it. Facts. Um, and last question, if you were a coach uh, and you were able to sub any player in history, who would that be? Like sub them off? No, sub them in. <laughs> <laughs> like just, I was saying, like just disrespect them, sub them off? No, 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 no. Sub, sub in. Sub in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so many. I mean, the first one that comes to mind, like, so Clarence Seedorf is one of my biggest inspirations just because, like, I loved his professionalism. Everywhere he went, he won. Everywhere he won, people spoke highly of him. He brought players along. He was a good mentor to the young players. He was fearless in the tackle. So, like, him or Ronaldinho, just to be like, yo, I need you to sub in, like, bring it home for us. So, Seedorf or Ronaldinho? Nice. I know um, you dove into some fun questions. I actually I know towards then I wanted to ask you about the foundation uh, just a little bit before, before we go here. Um, can you share with the viewers, you know, why you started the foundation? If there's anyone that inspired you to do it, so who and how, how you started the foundation, those would be the three questions uh, before you go. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, in terms of who inspired me to start the foundation, so many people. I've, I've, I've been so blessed that in my life, I've positive black role models in my life, and they've shown me good things they've done, but also they've exposed me to amazing people like a Rosa Parks, like a Bessie Coleman, you know, like a Kehinde Wally, like a Colin Kaepernick, things like that. So all the amazing blackness inspired me to start the foundation. The, the origin of the foundation come from, came from during the period of unrest in June 2020 with all the protests over the life of George Floyd. My friend and I, one of my good friend high school teammates, we did an online fundraiser on Instagram Live where we juggled the ball between the two of us for eight minutes and 46 seconds, the amount of time that a police officer murdered George Floyd senselessly. And the, the entire emphasis of the event and the fundraiser was to show the ball's in the air this long, and this is how long the person is not getting off his neck. This is so clear the person's been subdued, handcuffed, and just has no release. And the message was, there's nothing that can be corrected from that behavior. That is pure maliciousness that someone wanted to hurt George Floyd, if not kill him, if not make it deliberate, while George Floyd was handcuffed on the ground. And honestly, Eight minutes and 46 seconds, juggling the ball is so long. It took me and my friend, who's an accomplished soccer player as well, three tries. We dropped the first one at like seven minutes, 20 seconds. We dropped the second one at like four minutes, 45 seconds. And then the third one, we finally got to eight minutes and 46 seconds. And it just, it like, it like was amazing to see people donating money as we were juggling, sending messages on Instagram live. This is so cool. Thank you for doing this. But it like hurt at the same time, knowing that this person, was under a police officer's knee for not much of a reason other than he may be shoplifted from a convenience store. He maybe did something, but again, was completely unarmed. And the person decided that that person is such a, like a, a degenerate to society that it wouldn't matter if he put his knee on his neck for almost 10 minutes and basically killed him. So that was just the, the beginning. It went so well, we raised $16,000, which is one of the things I am so proud of, maybe the most proud of thing in my entire life. And from there, I knew, I was like, how do I keep this conversation going? One of that was continuing doing fundraisers. I did one in June and then another one in May, one in June, then in August, and then in May of 2021. And then hopefully going to do another one in 2022. And then also the second aspect of that is the shirts. So for me, and a lot of people, one thing I've heard about the shirts is it doesn't say Oliver White Foundation. It doesn't really say a website to go to. And for me, it's something I've thought about, but I'm completely okay with it. Because the focal point of what it is, is that it's representing someone who has been killed. And the message is not about the Olive White Foundation. It's not about raising money. It's not about any of that. It's about this person, Breonna Taylor, was shot eight times. That's why her jersey number is eight. 
I also have Laquan McDonald, number 16. He was shot 16 times unarmed. A man named Dijon Kizzy in Los Angeles was shot 15 times. So he's judge number 15. And like, to me, that is the most important thing. That's why the numbers on the front, we're not allowed jerseys these days, the numbers on the front. Because I want people to understand that that is the message and that is not one person being trigger happy. Your finger's not gonna slip and not gonna pull the trigger 15 times. That is an entire system that is through media and cultural appropriation and stereotypes have directed hate towards people who have dark skin because they are not understood. So all that inspired me to start the foundation. And it's, it's something that I think about every day. I think about the next things to do, but also it's something that I know like there are days when I don't always want to talk about the foundation. I've had a hard day, a long day, I'm tired, whatever, whatever. But the fact that I know that I've created these shirts, I invested the money to make them all myself. None of that came from the fundraisers. And I've sent it out to all my friends, teammates, coworkers, things like that all around the country and some around the world. So knowing I've spread that positivity gives me the optimism on days when I don't feel like I'm up to the task of really championing the cause of striving for equal rights. Got it. Yeah, it's, it's an amazing thing that you're doing again. Thank you. Um, guys, go check out, you know, the jersey. I mean, I guess one Thank last you. time, mention it so, you know, we're at the end here. Absolutely. Um, find it. Absolutely. The Oliver White Foundation, here it's set up. Number is on the front is always the number of times that the victim on the back was shot while they were unarmed by a police officer. On the back, if you can see, it has the name Breonna Taylor. They're all different for every jersey. This one on the front, this is the mascot kind of abandoned type figure. The reason, the inspiration for that was because, as you may know, a lot of police forces in the United States were actually originally slave hunting groups or packs or militias. And the quote unquote order that they provided to the state and to the municipality led them into becoming police forces. Terrible history, but it's history itself that should be acknowledged and understood. And it can help people learn from that and go forward and know that there is a history of racism within police forces. Doesn't mean that every police officer out there is evil, but until you confront that history, not much is gonna change. On the front, it says fly debonair. So obviously it's a play on fly emirates. But debonair is also, it's an adjective that means someone who's cool, who's suave, and it comes from French, meaning, in French it means of good air. So the slogan is fly debonair, so it's kind of like, it's a wish well for someone, like be fly, be debonair, be cool, be suave, but also fly debonair, man, like travel well, be safe. Step light, I like that. Absolutely, so Oliver White Foundation, the website is theoliverwhitefoundation.org, the Instagram is at owhitefoundation, my personal Instagram, at owhitechucks. Awesome, guys, go check that out. And Oliver, again, I just want to say, you know, I appreciate you taking your time to do this interview uh, with me and, and being on the One Soccer Nation podcast. This was absolutely amazing. Absolutely. Happy to do it. Like, another reason I love, it comes with my story, so they know they can do it. I love putting my name out there so people can reach out to me if they want advice, if they want to hear what happened. Because it's not like, well, for some lack of trying, I didn't have a lot of people I could ask when I was trying to go into the pro game. So it wasn't as easy. Maybe it could have been easier. So if I can help one person, it, it makes me very happy. That's awesome. Thank you again. Yeah. Thank you, man. It was, it was a joy to talk to you. Thanks for having me on. Awesome.